Well, good morning, and welcome to another week of Journey with Christ. My name is Mark Mitchell. I'm a preaching minister at the Park Avenue Church of Christ. And as usual, I am joined by Steve Fox, a minister for over 50 years in the Canal Valley, and a huge Cleveland Browns fan. How you doing today, buddy? I'm, I'm doing fantastic. I don't know when the last time Ohio State and the Browns won on the same weekend, but... But I'm going to treasure the these days. It wasn't Ohio State's fault. No, though. it was not Ohio State's fault. It was not at all. Now, I, we, Susie and I had a great four-day weekend. We had uh, our ten grandchildren at the house for those four days. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of rearranging beds and sofas and pull-outs. And, <laughs> but it kind of reminded me, and, and, and I, don't, I don't mean this 100%, but kind of reminded me when my kids were little we used to go to mom and dad's house in mansfield ohio and dad would always say uh, son you always make me happy twice once when you get here and once when you leave <laughs> so you didn't that, really get it but now you do <laughs> i understand it perfectly now because because we got twice as many grandkids as they had but it was it's it's just you're not able to not have fun when you're with those 10 kids yeah so we had all kinds of fun and went places and did things and but most of the most of the memories are right there in the house yeah yeah it um holidays are uh are a reminder of hopefully what heaven's going to be like mm -hmm. you know those uh moments where the cares of life are kind of set aside and, and the time that you spend with those you love is treasured and uh, you know th that's good oh yeah well I, I was thinking as I drove over here this morning uh, trying to keep them all busy and have them have something to do and they they're from age 22 to 10 so in that range right there you got to get something that both age groups can do or separate them and I got thinking, trying to keep those 10 kids happy is kind of as difficult as explaining Revelation 14. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to tell you, stick with the 10-year-olds. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I'm a lot better with them. than the, we got 20, the two oldest ones are 22 and 20, and I, I'm going, I don't know what to do with these two girls. I just... Yeah, uh, there is... But they're fine. Yes. They love coming to Papa and Mimi's house, mainly because Susie cooks for about a week before they get there. <laughs> and there's plenty of food in the fridge. Oh, gee. Well, last week we ended at the uh, in chapter 13, and um, with a wonderful e expression that I hope that we keep with us uh, as we move through this book. This calls for wisdom. Let us let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, that number is 666. Um, <clears throat> the thing that, as we move from this moment on, uh, this absolutely requires wisdom. Everything that we're about to talk about, but maybe more specifically, it's going to call for a sp spiritual insight and we're just going to go ahead and flat out tell you. We're going to be saying I don't, we don't know a lot going forward. Would you not agree? Oh, yes. And I gave you, I gave our audience a, a list last week of about eight names. And I could give you another ten names of people who think. I, I forgot Harry Kissinger. They threw, they threw Henry Kissinger in there a couple times. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, or uh, Gorbachev when he had that little mark, mark on, his, on his on his forehead yeah. that got passed around a lot. But what I th when I think of 666 and that's in 13 verse 18 that calls for wisdom. Um, I worked at a little deli for about two years in between jobs. Well, it wasn't that much of a job because I was making seventy dollars a week. So um, I worked there at that store for at that deli for two years and I I remember three occasions where people would come in and get their groceries and they put their groceries or maybe get a couple sandwiches and the and the total would be six dollars and sixty six cents 
And when it would come up 666, they would reach over and either grab a candy bar or grab a, some gum and throw them up. Or Something. They didn't want that 666 on their mind at all. And they certainly didn't want it on their receipt. I know. So, One time I had a lady that was doing the same thing for me. My, my total came up to 666. She said, you need to add something to that. I said, why? <laughs> I said, there's nothing wrong with that number as far as the number goes. Yep. It's what the number represents. And I said, it's not part of my... Well, part of this revelation phase is there are all these things that people put together. Yes. And so you get an Antichrist with whose name is 666. He's got a little patch on his forehead. If you put all those things together, they're saying you got a composite picture. Well, that's not what happens at all in the no. book. No. Hey, they got all kinds of descriptions in here, and I can't make heads or tails out of some of it. So, <laughs> Welcome to the club. So we're going to begin reading in uh, Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read through 1 through 5, and then uh, step back and uh, actually rehash some of this stuff, which has already been happening, except for a couple things. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like, a ro like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the lamb, they, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Uh, well, that's good taking care of that. Now in verse 6. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, Steve, we, we keep having, coming up with these confusing uh, descriptive expressions. And uh, you would liter they would have to be literal in, or in order for them to be relevant to us today. Because figuratively speaking, this is not relevant to anything that I completely understand. We keep reminding our audience that this is written to the seven churches in Asia. It was written to a group of people who were a part of the church in the first century. And it was revealed. That's where you get the word revelation. revelation it was yeah. revealed. It's not a practical joke that God pulled on people and said, I'm going to give them a bunch of mangled symbols so they would never understand it. And certainly the people in the 20th century or 21st century would never understand it. Yeah. It's not that. It's, it's, a, it's something that's being revealed to the people in the first century who were going to see these things take place. Yes. And... You, <laughs> I mean, the confusion over uh, the Lamb, of course, we, we pretty much get that, but then we have this re reference again to the 144,000. And now we got even a better description of the 144,000. They're all male virgins. If you take the two chapters that these people are mentioned in, the 144,000 are Jewish... Jewish... Um, what's, what's the other thing? Male Jewish males who are virgins. Yeah, and uh, I just I and, guess I could and, and I guess I couldn't think of that because it's kind of scary. I don't want to be one of the hundred forty-four thousand. No lie was found in their mouth. Mm -hmm. These are good guys. No, it's more than good guys. These are impossible guys. This is not. Let's just be honest. I don't know if you could find 144,000 men throughout history that were virgins or never had a lie in their mouth. The only way possible is if they died at birth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, so the, the 
description here of what it's what it's describing just doesn't really relate to anything that that you and I can uh, say, well, hey, this is what this is. It doesn't even relate to the first time in no. chapter 7, the 144,000 are mentioned because... There was less information yeah, there. Yeah, much less information. But now, we look at this and we're going like, okay, uh, it's like I told Steve when Steve walked in here and we, we were kind of talking went back and forth with one another. I looked at Steve and I said, I got nothing. <laughs> I mean, this is just totally... But, you know, admitting that is a whole lot better than going through and yes. looking pretending at symbols like and pretending like you know what that is. Let me um, um, wow and dow you with a bunch of... About once a year on television, there's one of the TV evangelists mm -hmm. who, who come up with uh, some idea about, let me explain to you what this is. Yeah. One thing that's, that John writes about this group of people, whoever they are, and, and the positive things... Positive things are discussed when you talk about these 144,000. And as we go down through 14, it's going to be judgment. Judgment with the good guys and the bad guys, the white hats and the black hats. And they either follow the lamb around and they sing this song of the redeemed, or they don't follow him around and they're yeah. going to end up someplace else. His name was on the, their foreheads. The father's name was on their foreheads. And he hears this voice that comes from heaven. And he says it sounds like, Somebody playing harps. Yep. Rushing and, water. But yes. it's under. But I look around and it's, you know, is this harpist doing this sound? <laughs> you know? Um, I think about what instruments are used in any kind of song. A wedding song, a funeral song. Uh, I've never heard a harp sound like thunder. Have you? Or no, rushing water. No. But I've heard a harp sound like the most beautiful thing you ever heard in your life. Absolutely. Violins are like that. The now piano the can be like I've that. I've dropped a harp or two in my life that was that would have been the crashing <laughs> You had a harp? No, I'm just... Oh, okay. I was going to say, I can't see you with a harp. No. <laughs> but what he hears is something that sounds like the harpers now playing their harps. Mm-hmm. Now, later on in the chapter, we're going to have people who, who actually are playing them. Yes. And so I'll let our individual listener decide which way they want to go with that. If, if there's harps in heaven, is it okay for me to have a harp in, yeah. in, in a church? Is it okay for me to have a pan, piano in a church? Because these harpers are using their harps. Uh, this looks like it's a, he says he looked up and he f heard this voice from heaven. So they're in heaven doing something. Well, it says from uh, standing on Mount Zion, uh, which would have been complete reference to the, I mean, throne room of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, it's what is always used as that reference. This is this is in God's, this is in God's realm. And I want you to notice in verse three what they're doing with these harps. They sing a new song. They are singing playing harps with their new song. Like I said, I'll let you go through there and decipher that and try to figure out what you think that means to you. I was like the sound of harpers. I heard they're playing on their harps and they sing, so they're doing both of those things. A new song before the throne. They sing before the throne a new song. And no one else knows it. And nobody song. else knows it. Um, yeah, to say that verses 1 through 5... I'm, they tell us of things that we can recognize if we saw them, but to to glean any kind of uh, revelation for us today, I I, do, I don't have it. I mean, you know, I, I know what I. I mean, if I was like John and that was, I'd be writing that stuff down. Okay, Lord, I hope somebody understands what this is going to mean because I haven't got a thing for them. Somebody else going to have to translate. Someone's going to have to... It, it's, it's almost like they're speaking in a different language. Yeah, it's like yeah. one gives a prophecy and the other one or speaks in tongues or whatever. The last thing we're told about these 44,000 is they had been redeemed from the earth. They're again indicating that they were the good guys. Yes. And he says they've not defiled themselves with women for they are chaste. C-H-A-S-T-E, yep. not 
C H A S E D. They're not chaste. In these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So there's a judgment again. you got people following the Lamb, people who don't follow the Lamb. They've been redeemed, redeemed from mankind as first fruits. Well, we know what that is. You have a cornfield. The first, th the first thing you take away from that harvest is the first fruits. Mm -hmm. Anything that you grow, any fruit, yep. any vegetable, what you grow... And Jesus even is called the first fruits because he is resurrected from the dead. Paul calls themselves as first fruits also. Yeah, yeah. But you know, we are some of the we are the first fruits of of this new uh, kingdom. Let's go ahead and get to number six, verse six. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth to every nation, tribe, language, and people. <clears throat> he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone who worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in its, Im in its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. Wow. You have, from the beginning of this thing, have talked about keeping our eyes on judgment scenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a pretty big judgment description here. And it's, it's, it's just getting started, this judgment. Uh, and... He starts giving criteria about those judgments. Certain things that are going to happen well, will lead to a judgment, and sometimes that's a seventh angel or a seventh scroll, or or something else that's seventh. Mm -hmm. But here he says that what's going to save these people, all those people, the 144,000 and everybody else who's redeemed, what's going to save them in verse six is the eternal gospel, and that eternal gospel, which is the same thing that the people in the first century were listening to, and the same thing that we listen to today. That eternal gospel is given to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It's not just Jewish. It's not just for people who lived under Judaism. It's for everybody. And uh, verse 7, he says in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. Uh, and again, this definition of worship Him and then descriptive terms of who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Which goes back to this concept that you and I have talked about. Decide. Make up your mind who you're going to choose. You can't sit on the fence. You can't. There's no fence sitting no. in this situation. You're either, <clears throat> you're either going to be worshiping God or you're going to be worshiping created things. And one of those created things is going to be a beast. A beast, a dragon. Yeah. Yourselves, the <laughs> yeah. world systems, all these other things. You, you have to choose God. And and it's more than just this verse from verse 6. They heard the good news. It was proclaimed to them. But then in verse 7, they have to make a choice. Worship now that you've heard. Choose. As my favorite scene out of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, in search of the the Grail, um, 
the night tells Indiana Jones, choose wisely, you know. So, <clears throat> well, in verse 7, no, it's in 6. In verse 6, when he calls this the eternal gospel, he's telling those people that when it, not only in the first century, but for all time, that gospel is going to be taught to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And these people are going to have to decide, like you said a minute ago, do I follow the lamb wherever he goes? Mm -hmm. Or do I decide I want to follow the beast and, and the dragon and those and the bad guys in these judgment scenes? Well, think about this. If you choose not to follow the lamb, in essence, you are then continuing this defilement that's already there. I don't want to give it away, but as we get down a little bit further, there's a couple references um, and some understandings that righteous people aren't righteous because of anything they have done. Righteousness only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's accepting, I mean, because... What makes me any different than someone else who hasn't chosen Christ as far as our... Uh, maybe, the, maybe they act better in public than I do. Maybe they don't get near as angry sometimes as I do. But the difference is this. I've made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I mean, I'm counting on Him for the, my inabilities fail constantly. You know, so uh, I always like to bring that up anytime judgment is brought about because there is the human tendency to begin to think that we've done it. We've and, been approved. And you know what I see in our world? I see it more and more the older I get. We don't like the word, word judgment and we shouldn't like the word judgment because there's two parts of it. And we want to make sure we're on the right side of that of those parts. Yeah. And so when he says the hour of his judgment has come, he's he's giving them a time. He's giving them uh, in some cases he'll give he'll give them a place. We'll get down to Babylon here in just a minute. But in in some places, there are men who are taught this gospel who don't believe it at all. Who don't care? Matter of fact, if you look at the judgment scenes in the Old Testament, Noah and the flood, the other people didn't believe that. They just thought he was crazy. Yeah. What's he doing? Uh, Assyrian captivity, Babylonian captivity, uh, when the Jews were taken into captive by the Romans. Most people don't think, well, yeah, that happened, so it's going to happen to me. He says here to these people in the first century, the hour of his judgment has come. You so did, don't twelve uh, spies who went over and they were all represent the twelve best. Yeah, one from each tribe, and only two come back and says, "Hey, God's got this." Yeah, everybody else was like, "There's no way, no and, faith." And there's another judgment. Who am I going to believe? Yeah, I mean, and for that judgment, then for forty years, nobody got in. <laughs> and, I mean, they all died off. Only their and their children could go in. Um, the only good thing about that was their tennis shoes never wore out. <laughs> yeah, their sandals never yep. wore out. Wasn't that a great thing? Uh, the second angel comes along and then cries out, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, which uh, you and I both know that uh, many references throughout, I mean, could have just as usual, easily, I guess, used Egypt in this descriptive term, mm -hmm. uh, could have used, uh, I'm trying to think of another nation that's used as a, uh, uh, well, Sodom and Gomorrah could have been. The it. Philistines. Philistines. Uh, I mean, there was many nations throughout the history of the Jewish people that was descriptive of bad and is going to be judged. And here is fallen as... Babylon the Great. They're the enemy. And the enemy is suggested here that it's Babylon. Yeah. Now. Because of the reference of the maddening wine. Uh, you of know, God's wrath. Well, it says, which is, 
Uh, and second angel said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Uh, which the is, revised standard says impure passion. Yeah. That's a good description. Yeah, that's a good description because that gives the underlying visual description of that's going on here. Which, you know, which is um, with the intoxication that comes from drinking it's like sin. You know, sin is intoxicating because in anybody who's got... Uh, it wouldn't be called a temptation if it wasn't a temptation. Right. Because when it takes you, it actually literally puts you in a place where you don't no longer understand what you're doing and why you're doing it to the, to the extent that you no longer make rational decisions. Anybody who's whose lust is so uh, overwhelmed, enraged, there's a... They lose their mind. Oh, yeah. And, and it makes them... So these are people that the second angel's talking about that have fallen into this... Uh, you know, into this cavern of, if you will, of, of trouble. And then we got the third angel followed. If now, before we go to the third okay. angel, let's decide what uh, Babylon is in verse 8. All right, tell me what it means. I said let's. That's, no, no, that, no. That's you and me. I, I, I'm only going to talk about the things that if I... You wanna, if you want to start some fun in your life, go to a preacher's luncheon anywhere and say, <laughs> who is Babylon in the book of Revelation? And then just get out of the way. There are basically two ideas. Now, some people that believe in a futuristic prophecy here. Still waiting on Are Babylon. still waiting for whoever Babylon is. It might be the Babylon. It might be, could be the United Euphrates States, could River. Be anybody. It could be anybody. But usually if you're looking at it in the, in the direction of the positive coming out of this, there's not any positive coming out of Babylon at all. No. Babylon is the one who's making all these nations drink that wine of that impure passion. There are basically two ideas. It's either Babylon, the actual Babylon, or, and part of that would be Rome, part of that continent would be Rome, or it's Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the one who, who has their judgment coming upon them, and they are the ones who are making all the nations drink the wine of her impure passion. I have my own idea, I have my own opinion, but I would certainly narrow it down to it's either Rome or it's Jerusalem. Well, you speak as someone who's definitive on that. I, I'm not there yet because I just, I cannot, like I said, um, I know that many times the descriptive terms is used for Egypt that wasn't even talking about Egypt. Uh, and I also know that Babylon is is the same in the same way. I mean, you go to Daniel, some of Daniel's writings. I mean, there's all kinds of descriptive terms used from the Greeks to the Rome to all this stuff. Uh, you know, I guess it, it's just as possible as anything else. Anybody else? <laughs> I, lo I look at this verse and I see very clearly. Here is a verse that. When you get to the gates of heaven, God's gone, not going to say, who do you think Babylon was? Yeah. In the big scheme of things, and, this... Yes. In the big, you're exactly right. It's not worth a hill of beans in the not, big scheme, it is not. scheme of things. Um, I, and I want to get to, and we're running out of time. A third angel followed them with, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on the forehead or their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. Uh, well, right there's judgment with a capital J. Yeah, that, that's big judgment. And here's the thing. Isn't it ironic? He talks about this maddening wine and you had of what what was it? Impure passion. Impure passions, this and my you know these adulteries. But then in verse ten, they, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which 
has been poured full strength into his cup of wrath. Which it would almost say, okay, verse 8's wine and verse 10's wine are almost the same mm -hmm. wine. Yeah. Uh, and 8's descriptive term of what that wine is is their own uh, desires has made this wine. You know, their adulteries has made this wine. Yeah. They've trampled on the grapes themselves and produced their own wine. And which now, verse 10, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength in the cup of his wrath. Um, which, this is where sometimes uh, this cup of wrath of God that's used not a lot of times in the Bible. It's mentioned in Isaiah. It's it's mentioned in Psalms. It's mentioned in a couple of the prophets. It's not used a lot, but it's always used to describe the of a judgment and the result of that judgment. It's it's you, what you're going to get is bad, and they, they it's always kind of like said as being this is what God's been holding for you um, which I could go in the weeds on this one big time <laughs> well when you as you're trying to get out of the weeds let me make the weeds a little bit taller here especially especially for me this is one of the verses that's in the Bible I think there are four specific verses like this that would indicate that it sounds like people who are lost and go to hell are going to be in eternal discomfort. They are going to be in pain forever and ever. And if I were debating this issue, I would take this verse and just hammer it home because it's, he says, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. So people get from that verse and other verses that when you die and you go to hell, you are without you were without being redeemed you will suffer eternal pain forever I used to teach that I used to believe that not that I'm saying I'm any smarter than I was back then but I've really changed my mind because of those four verses there are four verses that kind of imply that I could give you 50 verses or 60 verses that say something different different that they're going to die they're going to uh, they're going to be consumed um, Jesus said in Matthew 10, don't, don't be afraid of the one who can destroy your body, but yeah. be afraid of the one who can destroy your soul and body in hell. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could... And if, if that's just a little teaser, well, it's not really a teaser. It didn't come out that way. But if people would like to study that more, if they would like to see the context... Have them contact you. You, ha you have them call the church or send an email to Mark and I'll get you those that, okay. out, that outline okay uh, again we have in verse 12 this uh, uh, this calls for patience endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus and uh, verse 13 write this blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on and then the spirit affirms what has just been said, uh, giving rise again to this concept of judgment, and th there, there's a side you want to be on, and there's a side you don't want to be on, and we just had part of that descriptive term in verse uh, nine and ten and, and eleven with the smoke of the burning sulfur. And, and these people, these people who are in a part of this judgment, who are on the negative side. If you look at the people who end up on the positive side, here's the call for the endurance of the saints. What's going to keep me from that part of the smoke and the torment and, and dying? What's going to keep me from that? He says it's those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And we're supposed to follow that. Well, we're running out of time. 
we didn't get anywhere near through. You mean we're running out of time because it says the hour of his judgment has come? Or are you no, I'm looking at my clock on Oh, the okay. She really scared me there. We, we took a little longer than we thought. We we didn't think we'd have anything for you for chapter 14. Well, we're so glad you've joined us. And as we continue to try to, to move forward, uh, keep st stick with us on this. Uh, I know that what we've read today is very difficult in the fact that it's not exactly uh, clear as to what it means to us and and to what it would mean to to our our, our people at this time and as Steve and I keep pointing out it, it seems to have been written for someone else we're just getting to read the letter of, that was written to them do you have anything you'd like to add before we close out today? Yeah, it's just one thing. I really respect people who make an attempt to read through this mm -hmm. and make an attempt to understand some of the symbols and the, and the ideas that are in this book. Um, it's the only book that I know of in the New Testament that I've actually talked to people who say, I don't even read that. Yeah. It's like they gave up. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody's gave up on Romans or 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. But this one, you get to this one, and it's your, you're at the end of the New Testament, and you're going, I don't even see why I should waste my time. You should go ahead and, and take a shot at it, because there are lessons that we can all learn, even though this, the message was for 2,000 years ago. Exactly. Exactly. And <laughs> if you walk away, I've got nothing. That's okay. You you read the words, and those words came from God and His Spirit and His Son. That's right. So don't worry about... And you're not always going to have nothing. I mean, there are, like this verse 13, uh, you know, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. That is the truth. Yeah. And that is something to worth keep being reminded of. You've heard <clears throat> that phrase a lot at funerals. Yes. Yes, you have. Well, look, we look forward to meeting with you again next week as we continue our discussion on the book of Revelations. God bless, and we'll see you next week. Thanks.